very much to Morris for inviting me to come to Saskatoon. It's the first time I've been to this part of Canada. So I'm going to talk about another soil issue altogether from what we've just heard, which is uh, saline soils, which are endemic to arid and semi-arid climates. So I'm going to propose that there is a, um, a global need for crops for saline soil, to increase tolerance of saline soil. It, it's widespread. Um, it, occurs, it, it occurs either with precipitation from the rain over extremely long period of time, which applies to Australia. Any land that's flat and dry will have a precipitation of salts that basically has come from the ocean, from wind and, and uh, spray aerosol. Or it could be f um, the younger countries like America, India, from uh, weathering of rocks, the soluble components of the rocks. So <clears throat> the soil concentration will just re reflect uh, what the uh, base rock was. <clears throat> Now, um, urbanisation, especially in countries like China and so on, means that cities are expanding at a great rate into land that was previously cultivated, either for market gardens or for rice or other crops. And so to keep, to even maintain the supply of uh, grain for, fu for food, uh, the land area has to be at least maintained and that means it's being pushed uh, further into land that wasn't initially cropped because it was not so fertile or it was, the rainfall was not so um, good. Um, irrigation, you could consider irrigation, but this always carries a problem. It, it always puts in more water than the plants use, um, causes water tables to move, um, to rise, and uh, most, well, 20 or 30 percent of irrigation schemes throughout the world have resulted in waterlogging and or salinisation of land. So that's something that uh, can't be... Um, irrigation schemes can't be really started without great consideration. They're going to cause a lot of problems. Not far down the track. Some have only lasted five years before they've caused problems. Um, the, the other more recent things happening with... Um, global warming is sea levels are rising and the delta regions throughout the world are being affected. Now the great delta regions in the um, Australia Pacific area, of course the Mekong Delta in Vietnam, which is extremely productive, it provides a lot of uh, fish and um, for Australia it's it quite um, it's really important to the GDP of that country. And uh, the other one I'm going to mention is in Bangladesh. Um, the sea, le sea level is rising at about three millimetres a year. <clears throat> That's pretty solid now. Um, so three millimetres a year doesn't sound much. Three centimetres every 10 years doesn't sound quite so much. Um, 30 centimetres in 100 years, well, perhaps that's not our problem, but I think it's going to happen, um, the problem's going to happen a little bit more quickly than that. It's not so much the sea level rise, it's um, global warming as well as changing rainfall patterns is also causing more powerful storms. They may not come more frequently, but when they come, come with a lot more energy behind them and you have salt water, especially if it happens at high tide, you have salt water intrusions that go up rivers and can go up 100 kilometres or so. So here is the Bangladeshi government is really quite concerned about this. Um, so it's put out a lot of predictions and here's one that if the sea level rises one metre, which of course we hope it will not, um, it would flood something like a tenth of the country it would displace a tenth of the population, and the population of Bangladesh is 160 million. It's a very small country, uh, it's very densely settled, and it's extremely productive. And it sits at the bottom of the two great rivers of India, the Brahmaputra and the Ganges. Um, Calcutta's at the base of the Ganges. And all India has to do is to dam 
the rivers further up and that will really make it very difficult because that country relies on the monsoon rains coming and washing out the salt that has come up uh, the rivers during the dry season. So we're all very concerned about this and Australia's funding uh, quite a few uh, aid projects looking at the hydrology of um, Bangladesh and particularly the Delta regions which are already being affected by uh, sea level rise and saltwater uh, intrusion so much that they can't grow rice, which of course is their traditional crop. And on this farmer's left, you'll see the original rice, which is no longer productive, and on the right, uh, the new rice that has been produced by um, IRI, the International Rice Research Institute, uh, as well as Bangladesh has its own uh, Rice Research Institute. Um, so that's really being necessary to, for farmers to continue pr to produce rice in these delta regions. Now, rice is still a fairly salt sensitive crop, uh, not as sensitive as wheat. So we're involved in another project in Bangladesh to um, do trials of wheat in this area to see it's not traditionally a place you would grow wheat. Um, so it's got to be short seasons, it's got to respond to high temperature, um, all sorts of things. But it's, the trials seem to be going really well and the salt tolerant wheat that I'm just about to talk about will be included in this trial next year. So just a short thing about salinity in Australia, which is quite different from salinity here and other parts of the world. Um, as I've said, it's, the salts come mainly from um, the sea by the wind and the rain. It's mainly sodium chloride salts. Um, the concentration depends entirely uh, on the rainfall uh, and perhaps the type of vegetation that was there, which may or not cause rising water tables. Um, now, we don't irrigate crops. It's something I think a lot of people don't understand. In Australia, there is virtually no irrigation of crops, of broad acre crops, so rely entirely on the rain. Um, in the high rainfall regions, we've had the problem with rising water tables because the original vegetation, which was eucalypts, perennials, perhaps grasses, used all the rain. You, you take away the original vegetation, you put it with the crop and it might only use um, 500 millimetres of rain and it might be 700 millimetres of rain. So each year there's a few, well, at least 100 millimetres of rain not used, which means the water tables rise. And um, whereas if there's less than that, the, the salt stays below the surface. You don't see it. So um, this is our wheat belt. There's that, that belt around the edge that's just got the right amount of rainfall, not too much, not too little. Uh, in that area, we've had rising water tables, which caused a great scare about 10 or 20 years ago. We had uh, scenes like this in Western Australia, um, where uh, clearing has allowed the water table to rise and you'll see seeps. Um, obviously, the salt seeps to the surface and on the bottom photo as well, you can just sort of see what we call seepage salinity. So that's been managed now by planting back perennials in the, um, the critical spots. Uh, no more cl clearings not allowed. Um, and you really don't see these great gashes of salt any, anymore. Um, it, it's also they're very patchy. Other parts of the country, you, you don't really see it until um, some event happens like um, natural drainage is blocked by a new road be, be being put through and you'll see patches of salt coming. And the, the other s slide is from um, Harold Sapoon in Canada. Also, salt is just below the surface um, and occasionally it pops to the surface. So it's just a matter of managing, um, I think, not putting in fallow, um, doing things that really try and use all the water some of this is irrigated, I understand, to use the water that has been put on the, the ground. And I should say this top one, uh, that salt was managed by replacing annuals with um, 
uh, alfalfa or lucerne, which is a perennial and is also really quite salt tolerant. So the alfalfa has been able to lower the water table and you don't see these uh, salt coming to the surface anymore. In the drier areas, uh, below 250 millimetres in the growing region, uh, salt stays below the surface and it just looks a little bit like dry, so just like a water stress. So as I mentioned, there is quite a range in um, salt tolerances of plants. You've got rice, basically the most salt sensitive of all. Um, I'll just point out there is one species of plant that is not only very salt tolerant, but is very productive, and that's uh, the atriplex species, the um, salt bushes or atriplex species, which are really important because they do grow fast. Now, you know, there's lots of halophytes that can tolerate very high levels of salt, but they don't grow. They just sort of sit there. But uh, atriplex grows really fast and, in fact, needs a certain amount of salt to grow fast. And it's not a human food, but it's a very good animal food. And I'll just point out for now, right in the middle, you've got barley, which is quite salt tolerant. I haven't drawn canola, um, but it's a little bit more salt tolerant again. So barley, canola are, are quite good. And, and mustard, they're probably the... And cotton, they're the most tolerant of all our crops. Um, bread wheat's OK, and then durum wheat is, is much more sensitive, which I'll come to in a minute. And this is, uh, you drive out the middle of Australia or Western Australia, you just see, um, as far as the eye can see, um, the paddocks of salt bush and um, mixed with grasses, it's a perfect fo fodder for sheep. Uh, so that really has, oh, it's, 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 it's a natural, it's a natural plant, and it's just that old man salt bush is, is the most palatable of all of them. So that has been, um, very, very widely spread. Now back to crops. Um, I was asked some time ago by the um, Australian Durham wheat breeder, Ray Hare, if I could help him increase the salt tolerance of Durham wheat to equal bread wheat. And here we have a trial of Durham wheat in the middle looking very pale and worn, uh, surrounded by bread wheat trials. And in dry years, um, we found that What's happening, the salt in the soil was concentrating enough in dry years that it would affect the growth and the yield of durum wheat, but not of bread wheat. So let's make durum wheat as good as bread wheat. I should say, in good years, they yield the same and have absolutely no difference. It's just in, in bad years, the durum wheat suffers. Now, durum wheat, as we know, is a pasta wheat. <clears throat> it's a hybrid of, uh, original hybrid of two goat grasses, um, giving the A and the B genome to form a tetraploid. Whereas the bread wheat was a hybrid of three goat grasses, forming a hexaploid. So it's got the A and the B and the D genomes. Now, the D genome provides all the bread making quality. Um, it also provides a lot of genes for abiotic stress resistance. Um, it's what makes bread wheat more tolerant than durum wheat. And when, when we started, I already knew from work that was done in the UK and in California that on the D genome of bread wheat, chromosome 4, and the D genome had a, a locus, um, called KNA1 for potassium-sodium discrimination, which um, caused sodium exclusion from the leaf. So it caused sodium to be excluded from the leaf, kept in the roots, and was what made bread wheat more tolerant than durum wheat. And these are the three main control points for uh, sodium uh, getting into the plant. Now, it's sodium rather than chloride, I think, is the potentially toxic iron, and plants exclude most of the salt from the soil, and they exclude most of it at the level of the root. But then within the plant, there is two other very important controls of sodium transport, one uh, going up the root, and then perhaps one that <coughs> 
that um, sodium can be pulled back out of the xylem as it travels up the plant. So, because I'm a physiologist, this, this was sort of the basis of um, our project. And the, our strategy for increasing the salt tolerance of durum wheat was this, that we, knowing that brain wheat on the D genome had this KNA1 locus that caused low sodium in leaves, we would search on the A or the B genomes of durum wheat for an equivalent, like a, a homeologous gene. So we knew it wasn't present in modern um, durum cultivars. So we screened a very wide range of cultivars from the International Seed Bank. We included land races. We also included the other durum or the other tetraploid subspecies. So durum's not the only um, tetraploid. There's polonicums and carthicums and, um, and various tergidums and various others. We included those and then actually Accidentally, we included um, genes from a, an as ancestor of uh, tetraploid wheat. Um, I'll come to that in a minute. So we had a really quite wi wide range. So we had sort of wheat relatives as, as um, well as uh, modern wheat. And the other thing, because you need a screening method, you need a high throughput screening method that's precise, and ideally it doesn't need you to grow controls and it should be independent of the vigour of the plant because we had land races, you know, like this with cultivars like this. Um, and it should be pretty independent of, of temperatures, you know, light, um, that sort of thing, so, so it's repeatable. And then, of course, ideally you need to develop a molecular marker for this trait as soon as possible. So, as I said, with trait, we chose with sodium exclusion from the leaves and our screening methods, we'd measure sodium concentration in a certain leaf after a certain period of time um, of salt treatment. So this is some of the um, rather wild and woolly uh, germplasm that we um, ended up um, screening, the very tall ones, uh, land races um, and then we grew them up in these tanks, sub-irrigated sub tanks filled with gravel and Hoagland solution um, pumped up and down and we harvested leaf three after 10 days. So we just went around and tagged the leaf when they emerged and exactly 10 days later because salt increases with time in a given leaf. And then from that we did find a range in um, in uh, sodium uh, accumulation rate and then in another experiment we grew these plants longer and we measured their actual growth in salt um, versus control, so you call that salt tolerance. So this graph, <coughs> on the x-axis we've got the leaf sodium concentration after a given period of time and against that we've got the salt tolerance of that plant as biomass um, uh, production as a percentage of control. And you can see that the lower the salt, the greater the salt tolerance. This is sort of what we were expecting or hoping for, but uh, it was still nice to find it. Now, out of that, we wanted to get at the genes, so we wanted to pick the highs and the lows and, whoops, and cross them and stuff. So um, this is the sort of range that we uh, got. Um, the plant with the highest um, sodium concentration was the least tolerant, um, but it did provide an extreme. And then the, the, the low sodium land race was the one that we selected, and it's as low as bread wheat. So again, that's what we were looking for, um, a durum wheat that had sodium as low as bread wheat. So then we crossed the, so that was sort of our donor of our genes. So we crossed the low sodium line with the two cultivars in that very high um, land race. So we had a number of populations and we did all the traditional um, Mendelian genetics. There were two, we could see there were two major genes. And then with a bit of QTL mapping and a bit of reference to the rice um, 
what was happening in rice and in the end we got. Um, we're able to map two genes, so we call them NAX1 and NAX2, NA for sodium, X for exclusion. And they were both on the A genome, not the B. And then um, others had already mapped the KNO1 on the um, D genome, and that's actually a homologous um, part of the genome. So, in fact, as, as it turned out, the next two, uh, when we actually, you know, cloned and sequenced and all that, uh, it turns out to be basically a homologue of KNA1, <clears throat> 96, 94% uh, amino acid similarity in those two genes. So, in fact, we did pull out the A genome equivalent of that D genome gene. And the, uh, the way they work is that uh, NAX1 pulls sodium. It's not it doesn't actually stop it getting into the plant, but what gets in it, what little gets in, it can pull it back out again, out from the root and out from the base of the leaf. So there's almost nothing that gets through to the leaf blade. <clears throat> the NAX2 is similar, but it only works in the root. So it pulls out sodium from the upper part of the root as it's flowing up to the leaf. <coughs> the leaf uh, sodium is a bit high, but it's still quite low compared to plants that don't have these genes. So where did these come from? Um, as I mentioned, it turned out that um, we didn't actually expect it, but we found it accidentally in some Durham derivative lines that had been crossed with a Tritigan monococcum, which is a source of rust resistance. That's one of the major sources of rust resistance in modern wheat, a, a gene from Tritigan monococcum. And there'd been a rust breeder, had made all these crosses, deposited his derivatives in the seed bank in Australia. We included those because we knew they might have been rather different. And it turns out one of the rust resistant genes is quite closely linked to, to, uh, to NAX1. So, um, that, that means, that explained why we never saw these genes in modern durum wheat, because modern durum wheat derived from a different A genome ancestor. So we decided we were going to cross these genes now into our uh, modern durum wheat, knowing that was something new. So here we have on the left um, our donor land race, that very tall, tall one. And on the right, the current uh, durum cultivar, Tamaroy, um, which you can see is full of dwarfing genes. And so we did four, actually had four back crosses, <clears throat> and each was self. So it was quite a long, took a number of years to get that far. So we had four, four or five back crosses, actually. We had five back crosses where we split the two genes. Because we actually had, by that time, we'd cloned them, so we had markers and we could split them. And this was written up um, by, uh, there's an, a monthly magazine called Farming Ahead, in which uh, CSIRO always has a few pages, and one of them was report, report what we'd done about the salt tolerant dur durum wheat. So we had material ready to test in the field. And anyway, we had a phone call from a farmer shortly after, who said, I was driving my tractor around, around my paddock, uh, reading farming ahead, and my farm has just been diagnosed with subsoil salinity. He said, I wondered about it. They could only grow barley, um, the, and um, I think sorghum was the other, the other crop. But there was a lot of salt known to be in the area. And would we like to use his farm for our trials? And he had had it mapped. And you see it's a large farm. You can see the scale of one kilometres, uh, which means why you can drive your tractor around and reading a magazine at the same time. And uh, in the middle, there was some more saline patches. So red is more saline, blue is less saline. And um, we thought we could use this um, middle patch as a trial 
because there was a range of salinities, which was good. We had to have lots and lots and lots of replication, but at least we could trial it all in one paddock. Otherwise, you know, you, you've got your salt um, treatments in one part of the state and you, you know, controls in another part of the state. It's very difficult. So we had, um, so we went in and we mapped that more finely. That was with an EM metre. Um, and then we mapped it more with a handheld meter, and this is Ray Hare, the breeder, with the EM meter um, mapping at the surface. There was variation, still a bit of variation, even though it was absolutely flat. Um, so we had to take account of that um, with the plots. So every single plot was, was mapped for its um, salinity, um, which is used as a co covariate in the uh, analysis at the end for the yield. Um, the, there's no rain, but there's a lot of stored water, so the crop grew quite well. And then we took samples of the flag leaf at the end, and it just showed that, yeah, our genes had lowered the sodium content in the leaves very, very greatly. Different trials in different places, different salinity, showed the first thing was that there was no yield penalty in non-saline areas. Now, that was really important to find, because our next one uh, gene uh, did show a yield penalty um, and we're pretty sure it's due to linkage drag from that original monococcum. Um, so we did a lot of trials to show there was absolutely no um, disadvantage of the next two gene on non-saline land, but on the saline land it really came into its own and the more saline it was, the better it yielded in comparison to the cultivar. So on the more saline land, we had a 25% increase in yield uh, over the cultivar. And that was repeated in other places, but not with the same replication, therefore not publishable. But this had enough replication, so it's publishable. So we know now that, for sure, that's how this next two gene is working. It's stopping... A little bit of sodium getting into the that gets into the plant going up the xylem. It's pulling it out, and the um, um, by this time we we um, yeah we had the gene. Um, we were able to attach it to a GFP marker, and it uh, it's expressed only in the cells around the steel, which is what we expected because of an uptake um, transporter by analogy with other systems, and you don't expect it to see in the cells lining the xylem. So it picks up salt, sodium from the xylem and puts it into the cell, and then it effluxes it back out again to the soil. And I'll just show you a pretty picture of... Um, we're working with a molecular modeler in um, Adelaide who um, constructed this 3D image of our gene, it's based on a similar bacterial gene. It's a tetramer and um, it's inserted in the membrane, in the plasma membrane. So the image on the left, um, if the, it's the outside of the cell, the inside of the cell, and you can see this, the um, sodium molecule in the middle and it's being pulled into the cell because of the negative charge. And those uh, annotations around the outside are amino acids that a mutation in any of those amino acids completely blocks the activity of that transporter. And the right-hand image is the same thing looking down on it, so it's actually it's a tetramer. And again, you can see right in the middle um, the little purple sodium molecule. And then, just curiously, we also did the same thing for that KNA1 gene that we mapped as another uh, similar transporter and a very, very similar action. Move to the last part of my talk. Um, now we knew that that gene was similar, very similar to our KNA1 gene and the D genome, but not quite the same. Um, perhaps we could add them together, so perhaps we could... Um, cross the, our next two into, and our next one as well, into bread wheat. 
and and we did we saw that there was an additive effect of those two even those two genes are very very similar there was an additive effect in terms of the sodium uh, concentration in the shoot in the, in the leaf it reduced it even further so we crossed into a, a number of Australian current bread wheat cultivars um, and yeah all this is by conventional crossing I know you're crossing a tetraploid to a hexaploid but um, it doesn't need tissue culture or anything like that just patience and um, then we bulked them up and then we distributed these bread wheat lines containing our next genes um, to several breeding companies in Australia. Um, there's some pretty um, tough fields in Western Australia, but it's amazing the, the crop they get out of them. They get two tonnes per hectare out of them, and there's a lot of hectares there, so it's pretty good. Um, and then this is talking with the farmer, so we've got actually a bit of barley there as well as bread wheat. Um, anyway, he was very pleased to see the material. And um, a couple of the lines with our next two genes in the bread wheat background did really well, came out top, actually. Came out really top. Um, they're not released as cultivars because the genes we crossed into were now superseded. By the time we got this far, um, the cultivar we uh, put them into was, was already superseded because it fell to rust resistance. So the breeders are now crossing, crossing these genes into their current cultivars, so that's underway. And then, of course, as soon as we talked about it or published it, we had a lot of queries from around the world. And mm, it's a bit hard to see <clears throat> but there's something like 30 there's at least 30 breeding companies that we've supplied with the seed any public or government breeding company we've asked we've supplied um, the only people we haven't is the Monsantos and the DuPonts and so on um, so it's in that it's in about 20 countries um, about 30 breeding companies within those countries um, particular interest from Tunisia, which is a major... In Tunisia, 95% of the wheat is durum wheat. West Coast in Australia, 95% is bread wheat. Um, but Tunisia, of course, being on the ocean, it's pretty salty. So um, they're pretty interested. And also Bangladesh. All these countries are now... Across Egypt, um, Turkey was great interest. India, Pakistan. Um, all, they have to cross it into their current cultivars, into their adapted cultivars. They can't use our stuff um, as it is. So that's going on. And our current and sort of future work, um, yeah, so it's out of our hands now. They're in the breeding companies. Um, we're thinking of ways that we can select for other traits of salt tolerance. Um, still don't know why kachia, which uh, kachia and its derivative is, has been the big success in India. It's a bread, yeah, bread, bread wheat. We still don't know why it's salt tolerant. It's really got quite high sodium in the leaves. Perhaps those leaves can compartmentalise it well in the vacuole. Um, so we're using uh, phenomics tools now to, <coughs> to measure bigger leaf temperature to stomatal conductance, rooting depth. And also one of our colleagues um, is, um, has cloned the gene for acid salt tolerance, which is a malate transporter, which is also on chromosome 4D. And he's also breeding that into durum wheat. So we could end up with, well, we have got lines that have got genes both salt tolerance and acid soil tolerance from wheat in back in Durham wheat. It's going on. And just to finish, I, I'm seeing there's a lot of interest in phenomics in this part of the world. Um, the, uh, the Australian um, High Throughput Plant Phenomics Centre started up, I think, about 15 years ago, uh, in, based in Canberra and Adelaide. And um, the, our, all our fields now have got um, infrared probes to measure current temperature. Um, Anton Wasson is looking at root 
um, reading depth and he's got um, a field sample is scored to take out cores, um, but he's using fluorescence to detect where the roots are going just by the root DNA. Um, so he can detect map roots in intact cores. He says you can do it in the field, but I think he still brings it back into the lab to actually do it. The guys built their first phenomobile about I don't know, 10 years ago, and this is about the second last um, structure of it, which has got um, on the head, it's got all these laser green, the green seeker hyper, hyper specs, infrared camera, etc., on it. Um, and the LIDAR is used, of course, for mainly for biomass estimates. And I believe there's a, a current one going on at the moment which is motorised, so the person doesn't actually have to push it, they've only just got to steer it a little bit, and that's been commercialised at the moment. And just back to finish with uh, Bangladesh, um, we're introducing very simple phenomics tools there. Um, uh, they've now got an EM38 for measuring um, soil um, salinity, and um, we bought uh, the green seekers, you know, the handheld um, biomass um, estimates and um, and then we're swapping materials so back in Canberra we can do some more intensive um, phenomics and and hopefully provide them with material that they could use in, in a wide area. So that's all, so thanks my colleagues uh, back in Canberra, um, Western Australia, particularly University of Adelaide, of which I've, we've done a lot of the molecular work on the NAX genes and the, the two Durham wheat breeders, Ray Hare and Tony Rathden, Rathden, that were essential in getting this project off the ground. So thanks very much.